Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Romoff, and I'm President and CEO of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. And it's wonderful to have such a large group of people registered for today's webinar. Uh, it's clearly an important issue of real interest to everyone, so it, it promises to be really a terrific session. We're fortunate again today to have folks on different time zones, uh, both across Canada and in parts of Europe. So for those of you where it's morning, good morning for us here, good afternoon, and for those of you in Europe, it is good evening. So it's good to have you all here and making time uh, for today's session. For many of you, you know that uh, we have run a number of webinars over the last couple of months, and we focused the first four, in fact, on uh, ministers from the provinces of Ontario and Alberta. And today we're taking a bit of a different approach um, because we'll be uh, putting uh, CCPPP's Periscope um, on the federal uh, landscape and an opportunity to learn a bit more about a really interesting announcement uh, that uh, took place just a short while ago. And I think as everybody knows, uh, the focus uh, of the federal government has been very much on uh, the uh, impact of the pandemic and how infrastructure investment um, will play what the government believes will be a critical role in enabling uh, a recovery plan for Canada. And I know that's a shared uh, view by provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous communities, all levels of government across Canada. Um, and Minister uh, McKenna, of course, the federal minister of infrastructure has been very engaged in the last little while in um, making uh, revisions to the infrastructure in, in invest in Canada plan rather, in order to enable uh, funding to be set aside for projects that are very focused on COVID related initiatives. So that's a very good sign. And of course, as you know, uh, just a short while ago, the Prime Minister uh, made a major announcement of an investment of $10 billion in the Canada uh, Infrastructure Bank. And uh, that'll be the focus, obviously, of uh, today's conversation. It's a huge commitment on the part of the government, and it's a reflection of the important role, I believe, the government sees the Canada Infrastructure Bank playing uh, in its uh, broader recovery plan. So it's really important and obviously very timely for us today to have John Casola with us, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, John in just a moment. But as you will have seen, the growth plan that was announced by the Prime Minister does have a $10 billion price tag on it. And it's really identified five initiatives, at least at the outset, that will be areas of focus. And we'll hear more from John and his team about that. It's clean power, it's broadband in underserved communities, it's large scale building retrofits to increase energy efficiency. There's a focus on agricultural irrigation projects and also zero emission buses and charging infrastructure. As I think folks know, the bank has already signed an MOU with the government of Alberta to modernize uh, irrigation infrastructure and expand irrigable land opportunities. Today, um, we've got John Casola with us. John is the chief investment officer of the Canada Infrastructure Bank and uh, members of his team uh, with him. And it really is an opportunity uh, to take a bit of a deeper dive um, into the growth plan of the bank. And I guess a little bit of, you know, let's get a peek under the, uh, under the sheet and what the vehicle really looks like. Uh, John himself, of course, is well known to many of you. He's a recognized leader in the sector with more than 20 years of experience in structuring and advising on project finance and public-private partnership transactions in particular. And in fact, I think many of you know he was instrumental in advising on many uh, first of their kind P3 projects in Canada. Previously, of course, he served as managing partner of PwC's infrastructure and government services team in Canada. And before that, of course, a number of other activities which really qualify him for his current portfolio. Today, John is joined by Sashin Gunaratna, uh, and also Fred Bette, and I think uh, you may know both these fellows. Uh, they are both managing directors of investment at the bank, and they are, of course, key um, individuals in the investment portfolio and its delivery. And so they'll be here today to, um, to be with John uh, for the session. Um, and as we always do um, with uh, these webinars, we've set aside ample time uh, today for questions from our audience. 
And as I mentioned, it's not surprising, we do have a very large audience from right across the sector. Um, and it also includes um, good representation for sure from, as I say, outside Canada. And also uh, it's an opportunity for trade publications and others to um, get a chance to learn more about uh, what is a major initiative in Canada. And I'm guessing there will be a lot of questions and uh, we've got a process for that. So after John speaks for just a few minutes, um, we'll host a fireside chat, uh, he and I, and Sashin and Fred, uh, and then we'll open up the floor uh, to questions from you. Um, and I think uh, for those of you who haven't joined us before, there are a few features available to you today to take part in the conversation. So again, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll notice a comments section. You can share links and information with us and with each other. And on the bottom of your screen, there is also an area where you can pose questions to John and his colleagues. And there's an ability to vote for questions you'd like to push them up uh, in the queue to get answered. So if there are questions you see coming in that are real priorities for you, uh, please exercise uh, that opportunity to get them uh, closer to the top. So obviously we encourage folks to ask questions and we'd also encourage you to join in the conversation about today's event on social media and be sure to include our Twitter handle, which is at PPP Council. I'm gonna now turn the, uh, the stage over to, to John and then following his remarks, uh, we'll return and uh, have a sit down discussion. So John Casola, over to you, sir. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Mark, really appreciate it. Um, thanks to you and the council for uh, providing uh, us with this opportunity. Um, uh, I have to say right off the bat that it's been an extremely difficult uh, six months for us at the bank. And it's been difficult because we have been working very hard. Our team has been working extremely hard on these very exciting initiatives and on sort of a what I'll refer to as a relaunch of the bank. And, and not being able to talk about that with all of you has been truly difficult. Um, so I'm very pleased today to be at that stage where we can have an open discussion about what we've been doing, feel your questions, get your feedback. That's all very important to us. Um, and, um, and so to do that, I'm, I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time in my comments. I'd rather engage in a meaningful discussion. So I'm gonna do two things um, for the people that either don't know or have forgotten about what the bank's mandate is, I'm going to briefly go over what we do and, and how we do it. And then I'm going to touch on the growth plan briefly, uh, what it is, how it came about. And uh, and with that stage set, um, um, at that point, we'll, uh, we'll uh, turn it back to Mark and we can get on with the, the Q&A portion of that, if that's okay. Um, so uh, the bank. Um, Look, I think uh, I, I think it's 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 fair to say that there were a lot of questions around what we were doing um, to start, but we're we're we have a new governance uh, process in place. Uh, we have new leadership in place uh, in Michael Sabia as the as the board chair, and uh, we're very excited about what the future holds for the bank. Um, some of the changes that have occurred at the bank over the last little while involve you know, sort of a new and improved governance structure, which allows the bank board of directors to be the final decision makers on all projects. Um, and that's that's significant, I think, in terms of efficiency and, and getting more done. But back to the bank. The bank is essentially, it was created uh, in the recognition that the order for infrastructure in this country, all times of infrastructure, including sustainable infrastructure, is a tall order. And it can't be done by governments alone and it can't be done by the private sector alone. And, and so the thinking behind the bank was to create an institution that would in effect identify those projects that had some risk or some gap in the financial structure that prevented them from getting to the market uh, and welcoming in that private sector capital. And, and so that's what we have been looking for and been doing. And so if our first level of analysis when we look at a project is to say, you know, can that be financed in the private sector? If the answer is no, uh, then uh, if the answer is yes, I'm sorry, then we'll say, well, then, then you know, we, won't, we don't need us to be involved and we'll encourage them very strongly to pursue those avenues. If the answer is no, um, you, you know, we'll say why. 
and we'll do an assessment as to why and whether it's you know an extended ramp up risk or whether there's uh, uh, you know uh, revenue or operational savings risk um, uh, that just the private sector doesn't generally take. We can be patient capital that can fill some of those gaps. So that's really what we're talking about doing. So where do we play? We play in four sectors that are approved. One is public transit, trade and transportation, broadband, and green infrastructure, which includes clean power and other green infrastructure such as retrofits. So those are the four approved areas. Uh, one point that's very important for everybody to understand is we don't do grants. In fact, we're prohibited from doing grants. It's not a decision that we made. We're prohibited from doing so. So that's a very important piece of, of who we are. Um, the second thing is that we have to have private capital in every deal that we do. Again, critical. Now, we're trying to be as innovative and as creative and as aggressive as we can in recognizing that some good projects need to be treated a little bit differently. So we're trying very hard to resist a one size fits all scenario. And um, it, you know, when we bring in private capital has been uh, an interesting uh, topic of debate for us. Uh, it was assumed, I think originally that it had to be a financial close. We think we're, we're pushing the envelope on that. And you'll see when I talk about the growth plan that for some of these things, we have taken the position that we need to, as a bank, prove out the market, de-risk the project in certain cases, um, prepare the way, in other words, for private capital. And then so we can fill the whole gap at the beginning. And then if we can position it to sell down or be replaced whatsoever, be taken out in, in three, five, six years, whatever that, that time period is, depending on the specific deal, then that's also crowding in private capital. Because without us de-risking the project or filling that initial gap, um, the private capital doesn't come. So we're trying to be aggressive in that regard. And I think that's an important uh, characteristic and feature of what we were, how we're, how we're conducting ourselves going forward. Um, second thing is, um, it has to be revenue generating infrastructure. And so to some people that would seem quite limiting. Um, and in some cases it, it could be, but if you think about why we were created, and, and let's let's be clear here, we are a tool in the toolbox of the federal government. Um, so we were never meant to be the answer to all things infrastructure. They, they created us for a very specific reason. But if you think about flicking on a light switch and power, we pay. If you think about opening your water taps, we pay. If you think about taking public transit, we, take, we pay. And for those of us who take the 407, we pay. Um, for most things that we do for broadband, we pay, uh, they, it is revenue generating. And, and so the revenue generation piece of it is really meant to complement and support the need for private capital. Private capital needs to be repaid, as do we, um, our principal at least, and, and they need to make a return. And there's a recognition in that in the required structures. So that's, that's who, who we are. And that's the way we do business. In terms of uh, ticket size, I think you know we have $35 billion to spend. Um, uh, that was allocated to us when the bank was created. And you know, spending that you know, $5 million at a time is a tall order, as many of you know who are in the business. So look, we're, we're trying, again, not to be too dogmatic about this and have a one-size-fits-all approach because there are certain sectors that by their very nature, uh, you know, water, wastewater might be one of those and, and some broadband in some areas of the country is another that, um, you know, by their very nature, lend themselves to smaller projects. Uh, and, and those are very important projects for those parts of the country. So we're trying to be accommodating, but as a general rule, if we're looking at large transformational infrastructure, our starting point is to look at around a hundred million dollar investment by the CIP. Um, and, and so we're looking to be large, and work on transformational projects that really have impact. So that's who the bank is, um, and that's the way we generally do business. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the growth plan now. Uh, lots been written about it since the announcement a couple of weeks ago. We were fortunate that the uh, chair of our board, Michael Sabia, was joined by the prime minister and um, Minister McKenna, the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities in Ottawa. It was uh, a very high-profile event, and I think with good reason. I think the you know the prime minister's office once they uh, found out what we were doing and proposing really liked what they heard as did the minister's office. So to answer that question right off the top, the growth plan was something that was conceived by the CIB 
at the CIB having regard to the well-known government priorities. Everybody knows that this government uh, looks at much of what they do at their agenda through a green lens. Um, it's public that Minister McKenna uh, was talking about uh, a commitment to bring 5,000 uh, zero electric vehicles, uh, buses um, to, to communities across the country. Uh, broadband has always been important, but never more so than um, what we're all experiencing during COVID. Uh, and, and interestingly, the one potential outlier that it's been, as it's been described to me before is, is, is agricultural infrastructure. For many of us who have been in this game a long, long time, we don't often talk about or haven't often talked about agricultural infrastructure in the same conversation as the usual topics. Um, but I think agricultural infrastructure is a really good example of how the CIB does business. What we really do is we engage with um, governments across the countries, provincial, territorial, municipal, and indigenous, right across the country. And our role is not a procurement agency. We are not going to put projects on the street. Our role is to help deliver and invest in the priorities of those other governments. When we engage, um, uh, started to engage, particularly out west, the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan, made it very clear to us that the number one priority for them was irrigation infrastructure. So I think I like to describe the process that we undertake and our relationship building with those uh, governments and public sector entities as I like to describe that example as the poster child for how it works. We weren't thinking about agricultural infrastructure to be perfectly candid, but when we talked to them, they made it clear that was the most important thing to them. So that's what we focused in on and we found a way to make it work. And many of you will have read last Friday, we announced a $407 million um, investment in an $815 million project in, in Alberta. And that's the first of several to come. So that's the way we 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 came up with these um, with these things. So more specifically, um, what do we have? We have clean power, uh, two point five billion dollars. Zero emission buses, um, one point five billion. Energy energy efficiency retrofits, two billion. One point five for agriculture, two billion for broadband, and 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 a half a billion dollars for something we call a project accelerator. Um, and so look. In almost every other context, some of you will have heard me say this yesterday, if you were listening in the corporate nights thing uh, I spoke at, in almost every other context, $10 billion is an enormous amount of money. But in this context, I'm often asked, well, why so little? Um, how can you solve uh, the country's infrastructure problems with $10 billion? And our answer to that is, we won't with $10 billion. What $10 billion is, is an enormously good start. But as Michael Sabia is fond of saving, we're just getting started. What we did when we came up with these numbers in these categories is to say to ourselves, what can we deliver fairly quickly that will have long-term impact on mostly on sustainable infrastructure? And the focus on the deliverability, I now lead an investments team of over 30 people, um, all private sector, you know, former lenders, private equity people, capital markets people, um, industry players, all focused on getting deals done and, and, and implementing projects. And so we put our heads together and, and we said, how can we be bold in terms of what we identify is needed in the economy, but, but have regard to our current circumstances, which, uh, you know, are, are incredibly um, unique. Uh, thankfully, uh, and and hopefully will pass uh, sooner than we all hope. But there has to be a recognition that we need to help put people back to work. That we need to help build sustainable infrastructure and 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 programs that you know uh, uh, that don't have a meaningful impact in the long term were not of interest to us. And so GHG reduction, meaningful impacts, those were important to us. Enabling underserved communities and broadband to participate in digital in the digital uh, economy, incredibly important, never more so than now. So all of those all of those things we took into account as to how we came up with them and how we're delivering them. And and so that is also a three year time rise, because the other thing those of you in the sector will know is that um, these projects are uh, infrastructure projects by their very nature are unpredictable. There are so many variables. And so we, we thought to ourselves, if we're going to be believed, if we're going to believe ourselves 
in the fact that we can implement these things and really make this happen and spend this money. If this is real, we need to put a realistic time horizon on that and be very realistic about what we can deliver. And so we came up with a three-year time horizon initially uh, for delivering that much money. Now, another really important point, the $10 billion that were announced is not new money. I want to make that very clear because I've been asked that question a number of times since, um, since in the last two weeks. The $10 billion is part of the $35 billion envelope. Um, and that is okay. Uh, those are really just a sub sub uh, sub projects or sub sectors of the, the major uh, four sectors I talked about earlier on. Uh, and they fit nicely into those sectors. But we're just getting started, as, as Michael said, and as I keep repeating, um, you know, we have $2 billion allocated for broadband. If we're connecting households across the country at a quicker pace and we need more money, we will use more money. We have the ability to do that as part of our $35 billion envelope. So our focus is squarely on getting good projects to market. We're focused on engaging with uh, stakeholders. We have been engaging heavily. Many of you in the audience are advisors, uh, engineering, LTAs, uh, legal advisors. You will know that there have been many, many RFPs on the street. We have engaged many of you. We're getting the best expertise available to design programs that we believe will work, work well, and are based on all of the right inputs from all of the right people. So um, I think I'll leave it at that, actually, um, Mark. Uh, I think that uh, I hope that provides an overview of what we're doing and um, uh, uh, and, and a bit about how we're doing it. And I'm sure people will have specific questions about the initiatives. So rather than try and uh, the individual initiatives, Ryan, try, rather than try and cover them all off and guess what people are thinking, I'll just stop and let people <laughs> ask you questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, John. I can tell you that um, even though we haven't opened up the questions yet with the audience, they are coming in. So if nothing else, your opening comments have um, provoked a number of questions. We may actually uh, go a little back and forth along the way uh, through the discussion that uh, we'll now have. Um, we've called it sort of a far as high chat, but just us four guys uh, sitting around having a chat about um, the future of the bank. And again, as you said at the outset, John, it's important to recognize that it has been a challenging period uh, for the bank. We appreciate that. Um, just by the nature of the pressure on the bank to, in fact, bring projects successfully to market. Everybody understands that. And also with change in leadership at the board level and uh, the CEO, uh, that just makes uh, for a period of transition, which is, you know, just by definition, a bit bumpier than, than it would normally be. And so I think everybody appreciates the fact that that, uh, that being able to manage through that is a skill in itself. And, and John, uh, you're very much a part of that. So uh, thank you for that. And again, thank you for making time today. Um, I, I guess just a couple of things. You mentioned that the growth plan itself was conceived by the CI, CIB and, um, and of course, um, at the CIB. That's good to hear because there still is a little bit of, of uh, I guess, a challenge in understanding the relationship between the bank and the federal government. I mean, you are a creation of the federal government for sure, um, but there's also and has always been that that arm's length uh, relationship. Can you help clarify um, for us the relationship now, given a little bit of the changes that have been introduced, uh, and also how you see um, the two parties working together uh, to deliver the plan? Yeah, great, great question. So look, um, I think. The way I'll characterize the relationship is when the bank was conceived, and the prime minister said this um, when, when he announced the program, that they knew they had come up with a great idea. The part they didn't get so right was how they were going to make it work. And, okay. and that took a long, long time. And, and so to boil it down, um, I would say that the changes that have occurred over the last several months here, which give us huge optimism and allowed us really to embark on and um, and announce this program are because initially the bank was, I mean, we did not, we never had $35 billion, billion sitting in a bank account waiting to be used. The way the governance was uh, originally structured, it was conceived that on an individual project basis, an individual investment basis, we would need to go back to, to government, even though it was, you know, kind of 
you know, we need to convince them that it was the right project and then we need treasury board approval for that. So what has occurred in the last several months is there has been an evolution which the government has agreed to recognize the benefits of, uh, frankly, giving them full credit and agreed to migrate and evolve the, the, the bank really from a project by project approval to a programmatic approval. That's the way I'd, I'd characterize it. And so now what you have is you have the government saying, we've approved these four sectors. We've approved these dollar numbers. Over to you, CIB board of directors, uh, highly professional, skilled, experienced private sector board. Um, you guys make the decisions. We have full confidence in you. So now we don't need to go back to government as long as the investments we're talking about are in the approved sectors. Now, if we wanted to come back and say, hey, you know, we'd like to do rocket ships um, uh, that weren't conceived, then we'll have, to, we'll have to go back and have a conversation about that. But, but right now, that's the major evolution that's occurred from a pro, project by project basis to a programmatic one, which we believe will really help us deliver. Okay, thanks for that. Um, the other thing too, which I think probably comes as a bit of a surprise, certainly showing up in the questions already coming in, um, was your statement that in fact the $10 billion is not new money, it's part of the $35 billion. I, th I think for many of the folks um, on, uh, on this call, they identified uh, um, the word the growth plan with uh, additional funds of $10 billion. Um, okay, it is what it is. Can you can you talk a little bit about how you guys at the bank arrived at the ten billion dollar number? Um, given that it is part of an existing portfolio of of uh, of your financing portfolio. Yeah, look, um, ten billion is a nice round number, which seems like it was. You know, when we started with ten billion and said, "How can we make it out up to ten billion? I, I, I recognize the uh, the. Uh, sort of the tendency maybe for people to think that way, but it really didn't happen that way. Um, what we did was we identified the key areas we wanted to focus on. So we said we had a long list of things that we thought could be uh, uh, value add initiatives. And then we narrowed it down uh, to the five that, that we thought made the most sense in all of the circumstances. And then we really did an analysis engaging with markets in the sectors to, you know, what can we reasonably spend in three years on this and how do we do it? And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I think it's a good example on that is, you know, the, re, the, the way we came up with the number that we have on zero electric, uh, zero emission buses is there's data available in the market on essentially the retirement schedule for diesel buses across the country. So if you take those and, and, and work with the retirement schedule as they're scheduled to come offline and will need to be replaced, that gives you a basis for making a calculation as to how many new buses we could possibly fund, plus our initial discussions and consultations to give us a level of interest. And so, sure, it's it's not perfect science. I'm, I'm the first to admit that. But we have pretty good data set in all of these areas to come up with the numbers that we can come up, we came up with, then taking into account how long will it take to develop, roll out the project in, in clean power case, which Sash and his team spend a lot, a lot of time on. And we have a whole list of projects that we have been working on at various stages of development when we went through and looked at what the uh, what the likelihood was of closing specific deals over the next three years. That's what led to that number. So it, the fact that it added up to, you know, $10 million is 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 kind of coincidental. So, you know, it's, a, I guess, a communications uh, happy coincidence because uh, it's a nice round big number. But we really did take a, a, a back solve approach on it, focusing on the initiatives first and, and the dollars later. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to just turn to a question from the audience because it's, it's germane to the comments you made a bit earlier around the principal tenets of the way in which the board operates in terms of obviously uh, bringing in private capital uh, with through partners, revenue generating projects. And I think the bottom line, as has always been the mandate of the bank, is to focus on large transformational projects. Right. Um, but for many folks on the line, um, they're, they're wondering if, if in fact the announcement uh, that was made by the PM um, isn't actually a little bit different in focus. Um, so included in that $10 billion uh, announcement were a number of initiatives that appeared to go against um, 
uh, such uh, in that no private capital will be required or and the projects appear to be low down on the complexity or challenge scale. So is this a change in the fundamental premise for the establishment of the bank? And if so, why would that be? And could you talk a little bit more about um, the go forward raise on debt for the bank? And if there's still a desire to work with private capital debt and equity in, in the same way that it was originally uh, outlined? Um, good question. Uh, I would say to that, that I don't think it's a change in the way the bank operates. I think it's the bank responding to the circumstances of the day. Mm -hmm. I think that we view ourselves as playing a role in the government, the federal government's response. And it was our, us putting up our hand, volunteering to say, we can be helpful here because we have the skill sets and the capital to do so. And so, you know, it's a very important point I want to make to reiterate. I think I've made it, but I want to reiterate the business as usual part of our business is that business. We're really trying to be focused on larger transformational infrastructure. Um, so that remains our raison d'etre, as you put it. But what we've tried really hard to do, Mark, and I think, honestly, um, my a personal view here, one of the reasons of uh, what I'll call a failure to launch uh, uh, early on is that we were so focused on rules and 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 coming up with the rules around which we would we would uh, what we would invest in and how we would invest and and then we said okay let's go out and find projects that fit into our hundred thousand little rules and and the approach that this management team is bringing to the table and the leadership of of Michael and he's pushing us in this in this area which we're very pleased about is to say we got this all wrong let's focus on what's helpful what's valuable what are the projects we really want to do and then let's find a way to make that happen so to answer very specifically the question um i think it is true that some of the initiatives in the growth plan are a departure retrofits is a good example of that by their very nature they're going to be smaller in nature um but but it's so important there have been umpteen reports in the last six months about retrofits being the low-hanging fruit in the recovery and in sustainable infrastructure. And 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 so we responded to that. So I, I think I what I hope people will take from my answer is to say that we have become less dogmatic as an institution, less tick in the box and more responsive. And if you have a good idea, then come to us with your good ideas. And we're open to looking at them. We do have rules and restrictions and parameters, but I want to leave with this audience and really send the message home that we're all about getting really re uh, real and value added infrastructure built and not about ticking boxes on a list list of, of, of things that we do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we may come back to that with some of the questions that are, are coming in, but um, I'm interested too, you talked a little bit about um, the areas of focus and the allocation, how that $10 billion would be allocated uh, more generally amongst those particular areas. Um, what, what's interesting is that, and you made reference obviously to, to provinces and discussions ongoing there, um, but, but you and, and uh, your colleagues I know are aware that uh, much of the infrastructure in Canada is in fact actually uh, owned or in the domain of municipalities. Can you talk a little bit about um, the the growth plan and how it um, is going to be responsive to the challenges that uh, municipalities are facing? Um, and particularly, um, I guess, uh, because, um, you know, they, they are key players in the recovery plan um, writ large. And I'm just wondering uh, how, how they factor into this, the, this plan. Well, they're a hugely important part of the plan. I mean, uh, if you look at our core four sectors, we have you know public transit, which is huge for larger municipalities, um, and we have broadband, which is huge everywhere. Um, we we have green. So the, the the if you look at the the, the growth initiatives, uh, zero emission buses, we're in active discussions with municipalities uh, and transit agencies across the country. If you look at energy efficient building retrofits, I've been in two meetings in the last two days with different large municipalities about their portfolio of buildings. Uh, broadband again is, is universal. 
Um, and, and so we think it's very, very responsive. We agree they're absolute key players and they have specific restrictions and, and, and which makes it even difficult in terms of restrictions on borrowing capacity and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we're working with them right across the country, uh, important, um, uh, important partners. We're also looking, you know, we're dealing with them. Uh, I'd say there are a good five, six, seven discussions going on with different municipalities across the, across the country about um, uh, sort of, you know, marquee transit projects and how we can help and, and get involved in those projects. Uh, those meetings are ongoing and very important. Thanks. I, I, again, without um, pursuing this further at the moment, I, I think it's on the minds of a few people that for most municipalities, urban transit, uh, they're too small uh, for big urban transit issues. So they have concerns that are actually quite different. And again, at some point, as you begin to develop uh, the plan uh, in more detail, I know there'll be lots of interest to, to, to okay. hearing more about how it's responsive uh, to needs across the municipal landscape, because again, um, separating out the, the larger municipalities, uh, there's there's still a large uh, number of communities across the country that uh, will be looking to the bank um, in a way that can be helpful to them. Uh, the other uh, element of, of maybe the equation of, of uh, potential clients for the bank um, relates to Indigenous communities. You made reference to Indigenous communities in your remarks a few minutes ago. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics that the bank has in mind and where you might be in terms of um, rolling out uh, a plan that uh, will support the needs of Indigenous communities? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Um, Mark, I'll start by saying that one of the first things that that that, that I did when I took over this role is, is to bring in um, uh, a very senior person in our organization who uh, who is uh, our lead on Indigenous affairs. Uh, we have a, a senior uh, director, uh, Hillary Thatcher, who uh, is uh, Indigenous herself, has extremely uh, uh, a large number of relationships across the country is well respected. It was a former ADM in the Ontario government for uh, uh, for Indigenous Affairs. Uh, worked at uh, Indigenous Services Canada. So she has been a tremendous help to us in understanding better the needs of Indigenous communities and in building those relationships. And um, uh, and so we are looking very hard at how to best respond. And so this almost ties into your last point. You know, one of a couple of questions ago, Mark, where you said, well, these, these are might be much, much smaller. Part of the challenge, challenges in Indigenous communities tend to be that the projects tend to be smaller in nature. And the revenue generation piece of it is, is more difficult uh, in, 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 in certain circumstances. So, um, but that doesn't mean we can't do them. That's exactly the opposite end. That's not exactly the wrong answer. That means we need to put our heads together and we together as a team have challenged ourselves here to come up with a plan that 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 responds to those communities. Because, you know, I always I used to chuckle a little bit at the use of the word. If you look at sort of the materials around the bank when we first got started, they used to use the word transformational quite a lot. The bank is supposed to work on transformational infrastructure. And to many people, that meant big dollars. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, people that are on boiled water advisories and get a new water water treatment plant or getting a, a reliable source of power as opposed to diesel, it's pretty transformational for those communities. So um, so, so we are, uh, I think, addressing those issues. We're not ready to make any specific announcements at this point on that. We're dealing with it, taking a good hard look, and we're working with them constantly to see in what is announced. I mean, Clean power and broadband are the two biggest areas and most obvious areas, I think, uh, where the needs exist. Um, Sasha, I'm going to maybe turn it over to you and see if you have anything to add to the, the comments that I've just made on that. Sasha yeah. works with Indigenous communities in his uh, practice. Sure. So, Mark, uh, as it relates to the communities, you know, John touched upon what we are thinking about doing in the future. Um, we are currently involved in a number of projects that have Indigenous communities who are in the ownership box and developing infrastructure. That, that is larger. So for example, we're involved in the transmission line from Manitoba to the western side of Hudson's Bay to replace diesel in communities. And that's a large project and fits within our broader mandate. Uh, and there are other projects like renewable 
and uh, transmission projects that have indigenous groups who will be part of that ownership group. And while we are not uh, directly lending to help them with the investment, we look we are looking at making investments in the project and filling a gap to allow that project to go forward. And the gap really there is economic. It's it's you know not enough people live in those communities to make it affordable through their hydro rates. Therefore, we are looking at different structures to to enable that project to um, to become economic and and allow the project to go forward with our investment. Thanks, Ashton. And maybe here's a corollary, maybe for both you and and John. Um, so the bottleneck on many First Nations projects uh, can be the inability of uh, the First Nations to invest meaningful equity capital. So government guarantees and programs can take a lot of time. Uh, so can the CIB partner with First Nations to provide equity uh, for good projects? Yeah, the, the short answer to that is no, not currently. Uh, we have explored that. Um, it's a complex area for government because there are so many different areas of government that are involved in that kind of thing. And and so uh, I think we're working through that issue because we certainly see the value in certain circumstances of being of assistance and getting involved. It's a broader policy issue, I think, that we're working through. And there's there's a lot of interest in working through that in Ottawa. It's just going to take a little bit of time. But at the moment, we cannot do that. Okay. Um, fair enough. It, it is a complicated issue and, and, you know, quite frankly, as you know, the council has been working very closely with a number of Indigenous organizations. Uh, one is the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, the other being um, with the First Nations Tax Commission that's been instrumental in setting up um, an infrastructure um, investment uh, organization to enable uh, projects to come more successfully to market. And, and again, the challenge very often tends to be um, the mechanism by which uh, funding flows from the federal government uh, to indigenous communities across the country. And that makes it a little more difficult to um, focus on, on projects that are by their definition uh, longer term and therefore uh, need um, some predictability around the flow of funds um, beyond just an annual allocation from the federal government. So. That I'm sure is all in the mix. And, and as you try to work out um, how you might um, play a more um, impactful role there, and those issues will certainly um, come to the fore. Uh, so, so thanks as a start um, for addressing that question. I, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna move back and forth now. I know we're sort of in a, in a sit down session, but quite frankly, there's so many questions coming in that um, I'd like to make sure that uh, we cover off as many of these as we possibly can. So again, uh, for those of you in the audience who are interested, um, as explained a bit earlier, there are mechanisms to get your questions uh, into the list. And it's clearly nobody's shy about that from what I can see at the moment. And furthermore, you can vote to have a particular question moved to the top of the list. Um, and I have one now, uh, which um, has got a huge number of, of supporters. So maybe I could ask this of you, John, or, or yeah. again, um, either Sashin or Fred. So in order uh, for the bank to invest um, along private capital, um, will um, will the bank uh, favor the use of DBFMs as a procurement method for projects? Uh, favor DBFMs compared to what? <laughs> That's my question. Um, we, we need to have private capital and meaningful risk transfer. I'll, I'll say that. And if we can get there through a, DB, a preferred model, I, I would say, uh, unabashedly is DBFOM. That's what we believe a well-structured DBFOM in circumstances that allow for that. Uh, we're not, we're, again, we're not trying to be dogmatic here uh, and, 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 and use one brush to paint all deals. That's the gold standard we, or we can get that right. We recognize that that's not always possible. And that's always, that's, that's, you know, sometimes difficult to deal with operations in the context of specific projects. And so would we look at DBFMs? Um, of course, uh, we, we, we would do that. But as I say, our fundamental points have to be that there has to be you know, private capital in the deal. And the reason to have private capital in the deal at all is to have meaningful risk transfer. If we can achieve those things on any given deal, we can call it whatever we want. Um, but but that's that's really where we're coming at it from. Fred, did you have anything to, to, to add to that or? Um, well, I, I think it applies to different sectors in different manners. I think the acronyms might change 
Uh, the uh, retrofit business, for example, works on these uh, energy savings uh, contract. Uh, the uh, uh, and, and uh, the energy business or the renewable large scale renewable projects work on a different type of contract. So the acronym might change, but the principles are the same. It's to risk transfer to the private capital and private investors. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, for that addition, Fred. I think you know that's really a reflection of a, a little bit of uncertainty out there in the private sector around, in fact, the opportunities uh, for uh, for private equity to uh, to partner with the bank, right? So, because um, not, not every project has that finance component in it, and uh, there is a concern around that issue, obviously. Um, another interesting question, um, mm -hmm. what can the bank do to speed up projects? Uh, this is important, obviously, because, as you know, the federal government itself is very focused on trying to move projects to market quicker and trying to make adjustments to the way in which um, procurements take place to enable that. So can you talk a little bit about how the bank can play a role um, in ensuring projects um, move along quicker? And maybe you can answer that in the context of your development priorities. Yeah, sure. Look, uh, I, I think we're we're all in on, on the uh, objective there. So let me just say very clearly that that's the case. Uh, and, and so I think that there are two main ways that we can help and want to help speed up projects. One is by providing, not only do we provide capital, but we also provide an advisory service. And so uh, both Sasha and Fred, as well as other members of the senior team here, are all engaged uh, advising governments uh, and potential public part and public partners across the country on how to best structure their deals, how to get it to market more quickly, um, uh, e e e those are advisory services that we offer them. And, and I think they're, they're very popular and governments like to work with us because they feel there's an alignment of interest and they're free. That's never a bad selling point. Um, but there's an alignment of interest because they, they trust us that we all want the same thing to get a good project to market. So, so we're happy to engage at the right time and to help them set out uh, sort of a, a plan uh, to get to the, you know, the desirable spot. The second thing is there was a recognition of uh, that very important objective in the growth plan. And that's how we came up with that project accelerator. Uh, so we have $500 million that have been approved that we can use and access. And I, I wanna be really clear on this. So I'm really pleased to answer this question because um, the use of that fund is to look at projects in which the CIB is already engaged and is likely to make an investment after due diligence and the process plays itself out, but that suffer from a lack of development capital. And, and so we can help, you know, many of these public sector uh, uh, sponsors and in, in the North in particular, I mean, uh, you know, the Cavalic Inuit Association is a good example of this. We're partnered with them to help uh, cover some of the development costs, which would have been more difficult for them to come up alone. And we think that we paid off, you know, six months to nine months off of process by making that money available and assisting them with uh, all of the development work that needs to be done. So we have pockets of money available for those projects. But I want to really want to stress, they, it's not an open-ended fund for anybody that has an infrastructure project. It's for CIB projects that we think we can move along more quickly. And the second component of that is we can, in the appropriate circumstances, utilize that money for early work on a project. So mm -hmm. if we know, despite bringing in a private sector partner later, that certain early work, certain de-risking needs to be done on, you know, utilities or, you know, you name it, um, we can, and we wanted to put, you know, shovels in the ground as uh, one of these favorite phrases has become, but, but I'll use it. Um, uh, then we can actually access those funds in the right circumstances to get that construction started sooner. So I think we've tried to address that in a couple of ways. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, here's another question. Uh, in the past, Infrastructure Canada has focused on wired broadband. This is changing now. Can you comment on whether wireless broadband is a focus for the bank, or at least if it will be eligible for less populated areas in Canada? I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's a broad topic there. Fred uh, Fred is leading our, our broadband uh, initiative, so I'll turn it over to him to answer that question. Thank you, John. So the, uh, the simple answer is the CIB is technology agnostic when it comes to broadband. 
But as John mentioned, we, we do have some criteria that we need to follow um, and, and, and some preference or some at least urgency in de deploying capital in larger amounts to connect larger, to, to finance larger projects. But typically those large projects will point towards technology that uh, relies on fiber to the home or fixed wireless uh, projects or a combination of those two. When we talk about remote communities, we are right now looking at other solutions as they often pertain to lower projects or projects with very high cost of capital or very high capital costs, I should say, but the very uh, small population. And so in that case, then we, we are currently looking at uh, diversifying our technology tools with uh, and in collaboration with local government and with ICED to see how we can connect Canadians in more rural communities. And so we are looking at those different technologies, but our, our focus in the past was really fiber to the home and fixed wireless. And we're trying to move towards uh, other types of solution. But our mandate is not to finance mobility, for example. It's, it's primarily to finance uh, high-speed internet in the households or communities, not, not mobility. And so we have to select our approach uh, carefully. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's let's change uh, subjects for a moment. Um, and here's a question with respect to um, was the analysis for electrification of bus uh, transport limited to buses, or does it include charging infrastructure as well? Um, that's a that's a really good question. The program that we came up with as part of the growth plan um, is targeted at zero emission buses plus the associated charging infrastructure for those buses. Having said that, I think there's a tremendously strong case to be made for us to uh, welcome a proposal, which we haven't seen, on charging infrastructure more broadly uh, that would enable the use of zero emission vehicles um, throughout the country and, and encourage the uptake of those of those vehicles. So you know, we haven't, I don't have an answer for you because we haven't, no one's asked us the question uh, really until until now and we haven't seen a proposal. But I, I think in the in in the bucket of green infrastructure, uh, to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. We just need to get our heads around what the proposal is, what the gap is, why it can't be financed in the private sector, all of those things that, that, that articulated earlier. But we would welcome speaking to anybody who has an idea. Okay. Um, um, making mention of having seen the proposal, that flags in my own mind that uh, the bank mandate, of course, includes um, unsolicited proposals. And I'm just wondering uh, what the current thinking is and whether um, the unsolicited proposals um, approach um, will um, will be eligible, if you like, under the under the $10 billion growth plan. Um. I'm, I'm pausing a little bit before I answer that question because I, uh, I, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, anybody that has a proposal they would like to make is always encouraged to come to us. But look, we use the term unsolicited proposals because that's the terminology that was used in our creation. Um, to me, though, speaking candidly, it's always been a bit of a misnomer because we are not a procurement agency. We don't make decisions on which projects go forward. And so to take in an unsolicited proposal in that area uh, and call it that is, I mean, what we really are is what, what that speaks to is a sophisticated analytical triage, essentially. So what we would do under our proposal, our, our process is if you wanted to come in, we would look at your proposal and we would give you a view on whether or not it's something we think we could work with. We could give you at the end of the day, though, that proposal would have to go back to some sort of a public sponsor if it involved, you know, public transit or, or, or uh, assets that are generally owned by uh, public sector bodies. If it's not owned by public sector bodies, like, you know, generally broadband and clean power, which are, are generally uh, in terms of generation, at least in storage, are not owned by uh, uh, the, by the public sector, then, then of course we we would welcome we would welcome those types of projects. But at the end of the day, most projects, large projects, if you want to take you know projects that have been around since the beginning of time, bearing the Gardner and Plan Nord and and, all, and the Ring of Fire and all those, I mean, we get proposals for all of those things. At the end of the day, none of those really happen without the engagement and support of the underlying public body. So yes, we'll look at them. Yes, we'll help you. But at some point, we need to bring the other parties in. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, here's another interesting question. So recent news um, has indicated that Ottawa supports the Electricity Expressway in Eastern Canada, you know, AKA the Atlantic Loop um, in accordance with the recent throne speech. And so it was broad scope announced that the electric transmission capacity would be boosted in Atlantic Canada from Labrador and Quebec. Are you able to provide any more details on this initiative? Um, let, let me just say quite openly that we're heavily engaged uh, in the initiative, speaking to all provinces involved, and Sashin is actually leading that initiative for the bank. Uh, I'll turn it to him to make high-level comments <laughs> in terms of what he can uh, what what he can say. You, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you all imagine, the discussions are in in um, in varying states with varying parties, and uh, it, it, you know, there's not a lot we can say. But Sashin, over, over to you on that one. Sure. Thanks, John. Look, if I take a step back, um, you know, the federal government does not have a regulator for electricity in this country. It's a provincial jurisdiction. And um, there are many instances where neighbor, neighboring provinces are burning fossil fuels, where other neighboring provinces have a surplus of renewables. And, and, and the solution to that problem, in addition to renewable generation in those, pro in those provinces that are burning fossil fuels, is, is transmission. So as John said, we are working with, with the four Atlantic provinces um, and the utilities and the federal government ministries uh, to come up with a, a solution and a series of projects to wheel clean power from Newfoundland and Quebec down to, to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to, to help decarbonize the Atlantic. Um, those discussions, I can say, are moving very quickly and we expect that there will be some projects announced um, in the coming months. Um, and, and there's no one solution. So it's, you know, some of it is going to be renewable generation. Some of it's going to be storage. Some of it's going to be transmission. But it's a holistic approach on decarbonizing the Atlantic. And we are looking at different models and different ways of structuring these transactions to transfer risk, to enable private capital investment and enable potentially CIB investment and other tools that the federal government has uh, to help the Atlantic provinces because fundamentally uh, the population again is not large enough to just build these projects and have people pay through rates uh, in this and future generations. It's, it does need um, assistance from, from all of us um, uh, Canadians to enable and help the federal government meet its 2030, 2050 uh, climate targets. Okay. Thanks, Ashen. Um, here's a, um, maybe a little bit easier question. Uh, can you take, can the bank take developmental or temporary equity positions to ensure projects move along uh, and move along quicker, obviously? Yeah, I mean, as a general rule, the bank has the ability to play anywhere in the capital structure. So we can take equity, debt, sub debt, any combination thereof where it makes sense. So the, the technical answer is yes. Will we do that in a developmental stage? Probably not. Uh, we would rather just provide developmental equity in the right project if we believe in the project and think it's going to happen. And the way the accelerator is designed is that we would roll any money we make available during uh, during that development period into a, an initial an, an eventual sorry investment um, by by the bank, but taking an equity uh, making an equity investment in a purely developmental stage project is uh, is unlikely. I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, another question: Can you elaborate, John, on? The bank's preference from a contractual perspective to push retrofit retrofit rather in built environments, ESCO, energy as a service, pain share, gain share. What's your thinking uh, on that front? I'm going to uh, turn to, to let Fred answer that question. He's been spending uh, day and night on exactly <clears throat> addressing those issues. So over to you, Fred. All right. So on retrofit, uh, the bank's mandate, again, you know, as, as John mentioned, we're not a procurement authority. We are a financing uh, institution or an investment fund, if you want to call it that. And so, and, and because we still want to uh, encourage, pro we want to do a couple of things. One, we need to invest in large amounts. So investing in each individual project is going to be difficult for us. And so our approach is to invest in portfolios of projects 
And those portfolios can be uh, owned by one owner or it could be uh, one aggregator of, of projects within that portfolio. Uh, now, because we're making investments, there needs to be a source of repayment. And we want that, that source of repayment to be linked to the investments we are making, which, you know, if you, if you d tie the dots together, leads to financing the savings. And so I guess a short answer is we want those uh, energy savings contracts or that type of risk transfer, gain share, pain share mechanism to be in place. That is our preference so that we can look at the savings that the uh, in private sector brings to the building owners towards GHG reduction as our source of repayment. And so this is our def definitely a preferred approach. We Our approach will be definitely inspired by the, the ESCO market, what's been done in the past, and with the hope that we can come in with a, uh, a financing tool that can accelerate what the ESCOs have done and what the market has done to a greater, uh, a larger market or a larger addressable market in a faster uh, adoption and to larger amounts so that we can uh, reduce GHG across the country. Okay, so thanks for that, Fred. Sticking with the uh, retrofit agenda, I guess, another question. In terms of the energy efficiency uh, building retrofits that uh, folks have made a reference to, is the bank focusing on energy efficiency retrofit in municipalities, or will the bank collaborate um, with uh, PSPC, uh, the federal government, in retrofitting public facilities? So um, our... Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Fred. Yeah. So the, uh, the bank's mandate on energy retrofit is across both public and private sector, uh, but right now the exclusion of the residential sector, so we're not going to the, the homes. Um, so we will look at the commercial buildings, industrial building, and uh, institu institutional buildings, uh, and maybe others that don't fit in either of those categories. Um, so yes, we can work with municipalities and provinces uh, we will work with uh, large uh, uh, REITs and, and building owners. We'll work with uh, commercial chains or retail chains. Uh, we want to be across the, those different sectors and that's uh, and, and offer a tool that's flexible and can address those different sectors. So Mark, Mark if I could just add, add a word to, to that answer is to say that um, some of these programs, uh, what you just mentioned is one of them, um, electric buses is another, broadband is another, there are various parts of government, the federal government, that already have programs that address some of those areas and some stakeholders in those areas. And so one of the challenges I think that we have, and, and we're rising to that challenge, we're working with our federal colleagues and counterparts there in those programs to identify what those programs are and um, of A, avoid duplication, uh, B, avoid competition, but most importantly, and I feel that we're getting broad buy into this, uh, everybody in Ottawa that we speak to in those host ministries is very excited about what we're doing. Let's, if they have resources, let's put those resources together and make, uh, create complementary programs so they can supplement or complement what we're doing uh, as opposed to creating confusion in the marketplace, which I know is, is is a problem often because uh, there's so many different levels of government, not levels of government, areas of government that that are uh, have a hand in, uh, in 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 the sector. So that process is underway. I, I think it's um, it uh, we're optimistic uh, that it's working very very well, but it is a process and it's going to take some time. So that's part of developing these programs. Okay, thanks. So here's a question that's addressed to all three of you, so you can fight over uh, who gets to answer it first. The question is simply, when will the new CEO be announced and why has it taken so long to fill the role? These delays in filling senior roles seems to be an ongoing issue for the CIB. So really the question is, why is that? And any concerns that a whole new strategy has been laid out for the CIB without the involvement of a new CEO? And, and how will that be mitigated? Yeah, look, um, uh, why the delay? I can't answer that question. It's, can, a, can, it's, 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 it's a board process and the CEO is a governing council appointment and uh, the search took a while and the board runs that. And um, uh, it won't surprise any of you to know that they didn't consult me about uh, the way they were running things uh, on hiring a CEO uh, or, or what they were doing about that. So um, 
All I can tell you is that Michael is now on the record as saying uh, a CEO will be announced in the next week or two. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll beat you to the punch there, Mark, because I know what's coming. Uh, there have been reports and some speculation as to who that CEO might be. I have a very clear answer on that, and that is I can neither confirm nor deny um, that report. But I'll also add that if the reports are true about the person about whom they're speculating, um, that person would be an extremely welcome and value-added uh, addition to the leadership of the bank. Thanks for that. Not an easy uh, question nor an easy answer. Yeah. I actually try to avoid speculation, so I'm just as happy to wait and see uh, the announcement. Uh, there is a, corroll a corollary, though, to this one, and to say that really the new chair of the board appears to have taken a much more hands-on approach yeah. um, to the day-to-day -day operations of the bank uh, compared to his predecessor. Uh, can you give us a sense for um, if that's expected to continue and what is the interface uh, going to be between the CEO and the chair of the board? Well, look, th those are difficult questions because those are questions for the CEO sure. and, and the chair of the board. But I'll, I'll just say that I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I think our chair has, you know, uh, been enormously influential uh, and played a huge role in getting us to the point where we are today. Uh, I think uh, my pure spe my speculation is he certainly would have been as influential behind the scenes if we had a CEO, but maybe not so much up front. I think what you're seeing of our board chair and him being sort of the public face of the bank in the last little while is directly related to the fact that we didn't have a CEO. And so as for how things will be worked out, I have full confidence um, that, that they will be, but those are uh, questions to have them on this very platform. Maybe in six months, you can have the CEO on and ask, uh, ask him uh, how it's going. Uh, look, I appreciate that. I know that puts everybody in a bit of an awkward position. Yep. The good news is that we're going to have another session on the bank at our conference in November. And yep. at that point, the expectation is, in fact, you will have a CEO in place and up and operational. So we'll come back to that. Let me take you to uh, uh, another area where you, you'll feel a bit more comfortable because it's in your wheelhouse. Uh, can you provide um, insight into what happened with the Mapleton Water Project? given the early promise that it had, um, is the bank still looking at a bundling strategy for municipal water and wastewater projects? And what would be the next steps by the bank uh, on that front? Okay, well, Sashin led, led that initiative, so I'll just turn it over to him to, uh, to answer. Sure, um, thanks, Mark, um, great question. Um, we got involved in the Mapleton transaction uh, fairly late in their process. And we were invited in by, by the mayor and council to provide a stapled financing to the bidders on, on that project. Um, it is you know, a very innovative model that they had, uh, along with their advisors, come up with to address a lot of the challenges that municipalities are facing today, namely debt limits, um, uh, you know, rate payer subsidizing taxpayers and vice versa, uh, water assets being being mingled around with uh, the, the other municipal assets. Um, uh, no plan for investment in water because, as everybody knows, um, it, it's hard to make water investments and have long-term plans for water investment uh, when you have people who are elected on short political cycles because water is a is a long you know 20, 30, 40 plus year investment um, plan that you need to come up with. So, so they plan on uh, setting up a municipal kind of a municipal services corporation and having someone else manage their water under a concession model and have private investment and potential CIB investment um, was very innovative. Uh, very important to note that Mapleton was going to maintain ownership and they were going to be responsible for setting the rates. So they were not, this, this was not a privatization or uh, handing over uh, rate setting responsibility to the private sector. So uh, through that, we we provided a, a standardized term sheet to the to the bidders, and we allowed the 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 process to uh, to kind of take its course. And um, and and really, the township and their advisors led the process. Uh, after the bids were received, we understand uh, through the analysis that Mapleton and their advisors conducted that they felt it would be in their best interest 
to continue with the status quo than to enter into this concession because um, because of based on the bids that they received, they did the analysis. And, um, and because of that, the transaction did not move forward. They were very complimentary and thanked us for our involvement in trying to help get this project off the ground. Uh, and we appreciate that feedback. Um, and ultimately, we're open to, to exploring similar projects with, with other municipalities. And we've done a number of speaking engagements across the country with municipalities. Um, and, you know, again, coming back to John's, um, one of John's earlier points, we're not go going to solve all issues for all, all people, but we do think that this model does have applicability in some cases in the water space. And we're willing to have those discussions uh, with any municipality uh, that wants to put it forward. Thanks. Um, that's helpful. Um, another question maybe for you, John, um, and this is, again, not surprising, COVID-19 has had really an unprecedented impact on provincial and municipal budgets. And so entering into 2021, um, these jurisdictions will be required to allocate a significant amount of financial resources really to healthcare, which is and should be a priority. Uh, but as the chief investment officer, under the current circumstances, do you foresee the bank uh, government uh, granting flexibility to both uh, provinces and municipalities to be able to access CIB for traditional shovel-ready and shovel-worthy projects? You know, the ones we'd be talking about, roads, bridges, mm -hmm. Uh, sanitary uh, sewers in an effort to stimulate job creation and economic growth? Look, uh, I, I think the parameters of what we do, I think, are quite clear now. Uh, the growth plan have specific, uh, specifically identified initiatives. And as I, as I said earlier, and I mean this both in regard to the growth plan and in regard to our broader mandate, we're just getting started. And so today, do we participate in, in health care? Uh, uh, no. Um, and there are reasons for that. A, it wasn't, it wasn't contemplated that we would do much social infrastructure. Again, it needs to be revenue generating, um, et cetera. Um, but having said that, you know, look, it's, it, it, the day has changed. The world is changing on a daily basis right now. And, and look, the, the most often... The question I get asked most often these days, or one of the ones I get asked most often these days, is, "Will you guys participate in long-term care?" Uh, it obviously needs some. Uh, and, and look, the the answer to that is that nothing is off the table in the longer term. Uh, if we feel we can add value, if there are models um, that we can look at that makes sense for us to be involved in, we will certainly look at those models and we will advocate four changes to our mandate in those circumstances where we really feel it makes sense and we can be value add. So I want to be perfectly clear about that. Um, I think that so much is in a state of flux right now. It would be uh, premature for us to before, you know, there's lots, a lot of study going on and, and a lot of soul searching about what the right models are. And as I say, we're not healthcare experts at the bank. We're very good at what we do, but that's not what we do. Uh, and, and so we are watching the space very closely. We are engaging in discussions with those people who want to discuss uh, for a longer term approach, but we're really, really taking a, we're, we're very much taking a wait and see attitude at, at the moment on, on that, on that. Part. Great. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Alberta Hyperloop uh, project and um, where maybe that sits um, on the uh, horizon in the bank and also the Calgary Banff study? Yeah, uh, but the Hyperloop is a project that has been in the press. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, we would, um, I'm not going to say anything about that other than to say that we wouldn't engage in any project unless it was a priority of the provincial government um, uh, in Alberta. And, you, you know, you can ask them whether it's a, a priority or not. So we're just going to leave that one there. Um, uh, Calgary Banff, I think work is on, ongoing, uh, well underway uh, in Alberta on Calgary Banff. We're, we're expecting, the studies to be completed by the end of the fall, and uh, then discussions will ensue with Alberta. And 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 um, next steps, there'll be you know a, a go no go decision based on all the work that's been done at that point. So we're on schedule. We're doing work. Um, we're uh, lining up all the pieces. 
but we are truly in due diligence um, and and that due diligence is playing itself out. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another quick one, how firm is the bank on federal stacking rules? Um, I, I think uh, it's a really good question, but it's a complicated answer. I, I think first and foremost, we are subject to federal stacking rules. So as a, as a general, as a general state, uh, and for those of people on the line that don't know what that means necessarily is in a transit project, there might be a maximum federal contribution of say 40 on a large transit project. And so that means if they have a 30% grant by the federal government already, we would only be able to come in for 10% because any capital that we provide to a project is included as a federal portion uh, or a federal contribution. So that's, that's essentially stacking. Uh, there are different stacking rules for different sectors. Uh, for instance, there's no stacking rule as far as you know we're aware anyway for broadband in the north or for uh, uh, in, in, in the far north and remote communities. And so I think also by their very nature, if you look at our model for retrofit, um, it, it actually uh, involves and was approved all the way up the line at Treasury Board involves going over the 40 or 50 percent um, uh, uh, threshold. So. I, th I like to think that, again, I'm trying really hard to not get caught up in rules and try and look at what we're trying to do, not take our eye off the prize here. The prize is getting all good things done. And and what we're finding that in Ottawa, um, uh, under my leadership, we're, we're getting a willing audience. We're getting an audience that's truly interested in getting things done and uh, they're amenable to uh, to entertain reasonable arguments on why certain things should apply so or shouldn't apply. But what I would say in a nutshell is, yes, we're generally susceptible to them, but I wouldn't not have a conversation with us because because you think there's a stacking prohibition. There are lots of things to discuss, even in those circumstances where we might be able to get involved and make a difference. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Um, just one other question on uh, bank priorities. Uh, can you talk a bit about investments you might have under consideration now for port and transport infrastructure? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we can't really talk about any specific investments, um, so so I'll I'll be just you know, quite candid about that. Uh, we are uh, working on many investments across the country in all of the sectors, including those sectors, and when you know we're we're looking for. Uh, the opportunity to make announcements, but we want the announcements to be real announcements when we make them. Uh, and so we, we need for projects to progress to a certain point uh, before we're, uh, we're prepared to share them um, with, uh, you, you know, with the broader public for all the obvious reasons involved. There's lots of negotiations and lots of uh, due diligence going on. Um, so I, I don't think it'll surprise anybody on this call as to why that's the case. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say, stay tuned. There's, there's lots we're working on and uh, we'll, we'll be thrilled to share that with you as just as soon as we possibly can. Okay, so just um, taking the transportation issue just a little bit further, one quick question to see whether the bank's been approached to support the Alaska to Alberta Railway Initiative, and would the bank get involved in binational initiatives of that kind? Um, the answer to the first question is, can't really discuss what we've been approached on, um, so I'll be clear about that. Uh, the second initiative, uh, the second question is, yes, uh, our mandate is um, is is for projects that are in Canada or partially in Canada. The focus for us is not, you know, where the majority of the project is, it's what's the value to Canada. This needs to be a value add project to Canada. And if it's a if it's a transmission line uh, into into the US uh, from, from Ontario and brings real value, or if it's, a, if it's a railway that goes, you know, up north through to Alaska, that's gonna be the same level of analysis and the same quality of analysis to what value does it bring to Canada. Okay, thanks for that. I'm um, my own folks keep telling me that um, I'm going over time, so I'm going to sneak in one last question, and then um, you can uh, sneak away. Um, so uh, the question is: Will the bank stand as a bank guarantee for communities consortium to access loan from other financial institutions to build broadband in their communities, mostly in the current situation where high speed has become so much more essential? Um, Fred, do you want to take that one? Sure. Well, okay. 
And I, I don't want to answer a question with a question, but if I could, the answer would be, well, why guarantee your loan? Why not just lend you the money? Um, I mean, we typically do not provide loan guarantees. When I say typically, actually, I should say we have not yet and may never provide loan guarantees. This is not the tool that we use. We use investments. And so um, uh, what we would like to do instead is, is provide a, an affordable investment to that, that same project. And we think that would achieve the same goal as a loan guarantee and that it would be just providing direct uh, accessible capital to that project. The broader question though is, the project itself, Will, would that project fit within our mandate? And so we have to look at the uh, scale of the project, whether it meets our, our broadband connection uh, targets and, and go from there. So I think the uh, a direct investment is as valuable or, or equivalent to a loan guarantee in that case. I'll just add one thing to that, Mark, and that is that, you, you know, the, we, we do have, by led by our legislation, the ability to provide guarantees, but right. it's actually to more, more, let's get the wording right here. You don't really want a guarantee from an entity that doesn't have $35 billion sitting in the bank. Um, uh, so what you want is uh, a guarantee from the underlying uh, provider. <clears throat> so the, the legislation allows us to facilitate, provide guarantees in our structure, but really they have to come from the Minister of Finance in Ottawa. That's, that's what's contemplated. And so, you know, it won't surprise you given that that's what's required that although technically it is a tool available to us, we wouldn't trot that out as a plan A, B, or even C if we didn't really need it on uh, on on a project. It's available to us in the right circumstances, but we have a lot of very creative people sitting at the bank that can. Uh, we, we have a high degree of confidence we'll find another way at the uh, at, at the issue without resulting to resorting to that. Thanks. I really appreciate that answer. Again, you guys have covered a lot of ground, um, lots of questions. Um, they're tricky and tough ones, especially as as you say, um, this is a, a new uh, front for the bank. And so a lot of it is work in development. Um, so I think everybody on the line appreciates that very much. So thank you, the three of you, certainly John, Sash and Fred for making yourself available today and, and for taking on every question. Um, irrespective of um, your comfort level. Um, what I will say to everyone on the line is that, um, as you can as you can appreciate, the, um, the growth plan is um, uh, out of the barn, uh, so to speak, but it's still a bit of a work in progress. And uh, I'm especially pleased that, in fact, um, we will have the new CEO and other members of the CIB team um, participating in our conference in November, as you know, our annual conference is November 17th to 19th. Uh, the bank um, will be an active participant in that program. So uh, more to come from them. So thank you again for today. And I'd also like to mention, of course, I think many people know that um, that ACON has kindly agreed to be our um, principal sponsor for the conference this year. So a shout out to them, um, obviously um, an important contributor to uh, what is our signature initiative. And as you will have seen too, we've started to announce the program. You'll see a lot more about the program next week. And I think you'll find it interesting and provocative. Um, you've already seen that we've announced Minister McKenna will be a keynote speaker at the conference. We'll have a couple of more keynote speaker announcements to make over the next week or so, so stay tuned. Um, and uh, then just to finish off one more time, thank you again, uh, John, uh, Sashin and Fred for making time available for us today. Um, and I, I'm hoping that the questions that have come from the audience um, are are taken on board as ones that express genuine interest on their part. And I think everybody wants to make sure that uh, the bank's next iteration is a, a successful one. So we're looking forward to learning more of the details and to seeing the bank really play um, an important role as, as Canada and all of our jurisdictions around the country work hard to um, to really stimulate uh, an economic recovery that um, that will benefit all of us. So again, thank you uh, for your participation today and thank you all um, for registering for today's event. Um, we have a large number of folks that were here and I apologize for those questions I just wasn't able to get to, um, but hopefully uh, we'll find another opportunity um, to engage with the bank, maybe even before the conference. In any event, thank you all again. Thank you, John. Um, good to see your smiling face there. 
And uh, I wish everyone else um, a wonderful rest of the day and we'll be in touch again soon. Thank you all. Signing off from me.